Okay, In Defense of Ska will begin in just a moment. But first, I just want to say thank you for listening to the podcast. It means so much to us. And if you enjoy the podcast, tell your friends about it. Um, the best way to do that is to, you know, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and share our posts and let people know when they say, hey, is there a podcast I should be listening to? Say yes, In Defense of Ska. Go on to wherever you get podcasts from and subscribe to the podcast. Leave a five-star review. Let people know that you support In Defense of Ska, that you defend Ska. Thanks. During the 2000s and early 2010s, Chris Farron fronted the indie punk band Fake Problems. Since then, he's gone solo and also periodically collaborates with Jeff Rosenstock. As a solo artist, Chris has taken an experimental approach, both in terms of how he can put on an entertaining show with just one person and in terms of how he can market his art in today's era of social media overkill. Chris excels at both. He's also got interesting stories to say the least. I got to admit, when we sat down to do this podcast, it wasn't until about halfway through that I made the connection between Chris Farron and fake problems. Oh, yeah? Yeah. For some reason, I that had just never really been brought to my attention. I knew fake problems, and I knew who Chris Farron was. I n- didn't realize he came from fake problems. Did uh, Did you play with fake problems back in the day? Hell no. When <laughs> fake problems was popular... I was doing a crappy desk job. I wasn't on tour anymore. Sucked. Oh, you had real problems, right? I had real problems, not fake problems. <laughs> I was sitting in a job that I hated. But were you listening to fake problems while you were having your real problems? I was. And you know what? They were one of the bands where I was like, I had kind of, was kind of fed up with music at that point. And I was like, I'm going to give this band a listen. And so I was like, I like this. This is good. And then they broke up. <sighs> The good news is, though, is I can get into Chris Farron now, and he can't break up. Yeah, that's true. Are you still at that job, by the way? Hell no. <laughs> hey, if you have a job that you don't like, quit that job. Quit your job. There is literally no reason to keep a job that you don't like. I want to jump right into things. I don't want to waste your time. Beautiful. I want to hear the story about Mike Park telling you to quit music. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do that to me? <laughs> Isn't that what you told me? Uh, he, hmm. I don't know if he told me to quit music. He's definitely told me that uh, I I do TikTok wrong. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> he, he'll just text me and say like, "You're going about TikTok all wrong." Uh, as we know, Mike Park is a TikTok celebrity first <laughs> and foremost. Um, yeah, I mean, t- Mike. You know, anybody who knows Mike knows that he um, he will just say something uh, extremely blunt to you. And it's just always very funny to me. Um, Yeah, he tells me I don't do TikTok right. And I agree. I don't I'm not really trying to do TikTok right. Uh, It would be better if I did it right. I'm sure for my career. Did he give you pointers on how to do TikTok correctly? Uh, Yeah, he just said you have to make funny little skits, basically. Did he have any ideas for skits or did he just leave it at that? He pretty much just left it at that. Oh, okay. I'm going to try to, I, I can, I can read you some, some, <laughs> the kind of <laughs> fucked up shit he says to me on a daily basis. Let's see. He sends me texts, uh, giving me, uh, his thoughts on what I did wrong on each of these episodes. So <laughs> please lay it on. Yeah. Uh, let's see. All right. I'm scrolling up. Uh, da, 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 da. This is just a lot of him asking me what my address is over and over again. <laughs> uh, why don't you TikTok? And I said, I don't know what to do. You just, and then he said, you just need to be Chris Farron. Oh. And then the next thing I with he and I is I'm, for some reason, I always ask him questions about Ska because I don't know anything about Ska. <laughs> And uh, I, it's like a screenshot of a, a ska song on my phone. I said, and it says, is this a famous ska song? And he says, yes. <laughs> What's the song? Uh, uh, 
Byron Lee and the drag uh Dragoneers. Yeah, Jamaica Ska. Oh, uh-huh. going 60 Ska. Yeah, I don't even know why I was asking about it or where I had heard it. Um <laughs> gosh. Uh, 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 let me, I'm scrolling down now. You need to take a totally different approach to your TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> this is a totally separate conversation. Yeah, yeah. I said, I said, I know. And he said, it has to be you doing skits, short skits, but nothing to do with your music. And I said, okay. And then he said, build you as a personality. And then I guess I didn't reply for like four seconds. And he, the next thing he said was, you hate my suggestions. Why do you? <laughs> Why do you hate me so much? <laughs> and then I said, no, I like them. I just don't have any ideas. And then he said, why do you hate me so much? And then I said, I love you. And then he said, why do you hate me so much? <laughs> yeah. Is that when he uh, posted on Twitter that Chris Farron hates me? Yes, probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then I wasn't posting enough about my Christmas album that he put out the vinyl for. And so he was harassing me about that. And I said, should I post on Friday? And he said, yes, Friday. And I said, okay, great. Sorry, I've been traveling all day. And then he said, you hate me. (laughs) And then I said, no, I love you. And then he said, yay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So that, yeah, that's, that's my vibe with Mike Park. So I guess in a way he told me to not, uh, talk about my music on TikTok. So that's probably where the, the, the misunderstanding. Okay, so don't quit music. Stop leading with music if you're trying to yeah. promote your music, basically. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty solid advice. He's actually right. He certainly is right. I just, I just, uh, uh, there's just so much. Uh, he's like legitimately good at TikTok and legitimately has found like a, a really good way of doing it that is very him. And I, all I, you know, I'm not real. I'm I, I'm not compelled to go on TikTok, so I don't really understand the language of it still. Um, and anytime I see a band doing anything on TikTok, it makes me want to fucking kill myself. So <laughs> I, uh, it's just a lot of really corny shit that I I just need to I just need to figure out what my corny thing is going to be. I, I haven't been keeping up with Mike's TikTok. I just remember when he started, he posted videos where he was complaining about people um, yeah, that's what it ordering is. That's basically all it is it still, still does that but it's very successful i, I it's very <laughs> and it's very funny all right so um john denominici uh i asked him i said what should i ask chris farron he said you got to ask him about the turkey problems story sure 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 and that it is good and horrifying sure yeah let's hear it okay so my old band fake problems we were on tour uh, driving through uh, Tennessee, I think Tennessee or Mississippi. I always get those two mixed up. Um, and I, so normally there was four of us in the van, but this time there was only three of us because our guitar player had gone out like partying with the band we were on tour with and decided just to ride with them. Mm. So it's just the three of us uh, in, in the, in the van so my friend Derek, the bass player, uh, driving, my friend Sean, the drummer in the passenger seat, and me right behind them in the van. And we had a trailer at this time. I don't really know why. We probably shouldn't have had a trailer, but we did. So the van was like totally just for, for bodies. And we're driving along, and it's kind of a long drive. And I'm, and I'm thinking, maybe I'll go in the, in the way back and, and, and just sleep. And so I get back there, and I'm laying down. Uh, in my little sleeping bag, and this is not something I have I had ever done before, hmm. and not something I have ever done since. Uh, but I hmm. thought, well, there's so much room between us; it's almost <laughs> like I'm in a whole freaking different room, and I'm in my little <laughs> sleeping bag. I might as yeah. well crank one out, of course. And so I am sitting there on my BlackBerry, facing heaven, cranking off. And uh, right uh, towards the end of my little session, um, which for me is usually the best part, um, I I hear the, the Derek, the driver, like going, whoa, whoa. And I my first thought was, oh, my God, somehow they have caught me. <laughs> but then the next thing I know, so I, I'm like facing this, this, the ceiling. And the next thing I know, I hear a loud bang. 
and then I see like uh just shards or like you know the the little like tiny little windshield glass uh raining down over me and i'm like pretty far away from the front and so i go so my first thought is oh my god we got in a car accident so then i like i'm about to like r- raise up and then a a big mass of, of like a big just like brown blur is is on top of me and i'm like what is that and i saw a, like a talon like a claw and and my first thought was there was like a hawk in the in the van <laughs> and i'm like kicking at it i'm in my sleeping bag just kicking at it and the uh the whatever it was kind of flops down and underneath the seat and then i i kind of like raise my head up and i look t- uh, to the to the front of the van and there's just a big hole in the middle of the of the of the windshield um and and Derek is still driving but he's looking out the hole so he can see where where, <laughs> where we're going and he's like pulling off uh so they we pull off to the side of the road uh and it's snowing also uh pull off <laughs> pull off to the side of the road Sean opens the 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 side door of the van goes Chris you got to get out of the car and I'm like trying to find my my pants inside of my, the uh the sleeping bag and i'm you know i'm still wait your bo- your boner survived the, the crash <laughs> i mean this is all so fast like i'm like one second away from <laughs> coming and then all of a sudden there's a there's a there's a there's a, a creature on me uh so so I finally, you know, get get out of the van and we open the, the back door of the van and underneath the seat is like a, just a turkey, like a dead turkey, like a literal a turkey. Like it was insane. The craziest. I, I pray to God it is the craziest thing that will ever happen to me. <laughs> um, Yeah. And that and so and then it was like a Friday night. And we couldn't get the windshield fixed until like Monday morning, so we were stuck in this in this town all weekend, uh, and had to cancel like three shows. Yeah, but if you if you Google like fake problems Turkey, you will find pictures uh, of like Sean the drummer like holding the turkey like after we pulled it out of the van, and like there's some pictures of the 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 damage that it did to the windshield, and there was like feathers everywhere it was insane it was like you know how like glitter gets everywhere it was like feathers everywhere and there was blood all over my sleeping bag it was it was insane so considering that this happened at the time it happened for you and what you were doing Uh uh-huh did anything (laughs) get imprinted on your Your and I, and I never <laughs> jacked off again. Uh, uh, no, no, unfortunately, it did not. Unfortunately, that that could not stop me. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't. It didn't imprint like a, ne- a new necessity. No, no, no. Thank God. No, yeah, yeah. The thrill, the thrill of it. <laughs> I've been chasing it ever since. <laughs> And I used uh, for a very long time, I told that story without the detail of of what I was doing. And it still kind of holds up. But at a certain point, I was like, I have to I have to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) Time to confess. You took your pants all the way off inside of the sleeping bag. I think I think they were like around my. I think they were probably if knowing me, they were probably around one of my legs still, you know, (laughs) just one. Like so, not, yeah. so I wasn't like constricted by like you know like so I, yeah. yeah all right and that you weren't you know totally naked either right I'm not an animal yeah. I'm not a monster <laughs> <laughs> got to keep that shin covered yeah yeah um there's another fake problems tour story where you guys are um, get arrested in Sarasota Florida for trespassing yeah um we so so three of us. Uh, we, so three of us were like 20 and one of us was 21 at the time and we were playing at a bar. Um, and I, I wonder how, if this kind of thing still goes on, but basically they were like, you can't come in, you can come in when you play, but you, that's all we're going to allow for, which is annoying, of course. Uh, but we were like, okay, whatever. So we were, 
the three of us were just kind of dicking around outside. And then, so it was, the venue was like a bar inside of like a strip mall. So there was other shops. There was like a tattoo shop and like a nail salon and, and other stuff. Uh, and we were kind of like in the back alley and we, we decided to just like hop up on the roof of the strip mall. And so we, we just kind of like hopped up there like somehow and we're just literally just kind of wandering around on the roof. And the, uh, so we're, we're wandering around up there and then, uh, we hear a, a, I think some friends of ours like going like, Hey, Hey, you got to get down. They just called the cops. And like at the exact moment that, that these people that our friends told us, they called the cops, like literally like three or four cop cars, like swoop into the, the parking lot. And I, I jumped down, uh, first and really hurt my ankle actually. Um, and kind of like, uh, make my way like into, there was like a group of people outside and I was kind of undetected by the police at first, but the, the cops saw a friend of ours and thought that it was him who had jumped down and grabbed him and like, kind of like put him on the sidewalk and we're like, you got to stay here. And then they were kind of waiting for the other two to jump down. The other two weren't hiding. They were just like, okay, we're coming down. We're coming down. And our my friend Sean jumped down and they immediately like grabbed him and like pinned him up against a door and were like yelling, uh, stop resisting, stop resisting. And I'm like, knowing Sean, and if anybody knows Sean, there's absolutely no way he was resisting <laughs> to be arrested. <laughs> he was certainly like extremely terrified as we all were. Um, and then uh, uh, they got Casey down and then they were interrogating the three of them. And I was like <laughs> off to the side thinking, well, I, I somehow got away with this. And they're like uh, interrogating them. And, and they're like, so it was the three of you. And, and they were like, uh, and, and I could see that our friend Daryl was like mortified that this was happening to him. And I was like, this is this. I have to, it was me. <laughs> I was like, it wasn't him. It was me. So I swapped, I swapped in for Daryl. And then basically they took us to jail. Oh wait. Oh, before, before that happened, while they were, <laughs> while we were on the sidewalk, a guy, a drunk guy from the bar was just yelling at the cops, which is always such a great idea <laughs> when you're drunk <laughs> to be yelling at cops. So they arrested that guy who was just yelling at the cops, some drunk asshole. Um, and then, yeah. And then took us all to the police station in Sarasota and, uh, Casey and Sean got, got to be in a cell together. And then I was in a cell with the drunk guy <laughs> who was very upset and just, you know, yelling, you know, all night. Uh, we were, I, I don't remember exactly how long we were there. We were probably there for like, maybe like six or seven hours uh, until Daryl bailed us out. Good on Daryl. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's basically, that's basically the story. Uh, they gave us, um, you know, a community, community service hours. Uh, and and they ordered us to go to an anger management course, which to this day still it like kind of baffles the three of us because we're like, what was what? I don't this is truly makes no sense because uh, there was nothing violent or aggressive about anything that happened. What was anger management classes like? It was uh, pretty wild to be uh, in that situation when you don't really when you don't have a. Uh, a problem with it <laughs> especially especially the part where they went around the uh went around the circle and asked everybody what they did and the three of us said we were trespassing on a on the roof of a of a strip mall <laughs> and, and, and and literally everybody was like huh and we're like i don't know yeah i have no idea everybody else is like i beat up my girlfriend's kid like all this other like insane like violent crime <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that was that was pretty wild and the the thing that i remember most about anger management was the 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 instructor or whatever he kept saying the word pacifically when he meant to say spe specifically 
And he said it like, he must have said it seven times. And at a certain point, I was like, is this like a test to see if I'm going to lose my fucking mind? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so that's that that was my main takeaway from that. So Jeff Rosenstock told me to ask you about uh, Martin Starr. Wow. Yeah, here we go. I got all my little stories. I'm really I'm I'm plowing through them. So Martin Starr, people know from hmm, what's he in? Uh, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, Knocked Up, uh, Freaks and Geeks. When I was, I must have been like 13 or 14, uh, I was in some sort of like film, I, I went to some sort of like film day camp to just learn about like the the movie business, I guess, in, in Marco Island, Florida, because there was like a Marco Island film festival and part of the film festival was like classes for kids and i was homeschooled so my mom was always kind of signing me up for like whatever like a- anything that seemed kind of like remotely interesting to me which was cool uh and so i guess martin Starr and a woman who was uh played one of the daughters on the nanny they had a they oh. had some sort of in- independent film that they uh that that was at the the festival and they came to the class and talked to us and there was like a Q&A or like kind of like a meet and greet kind of vibe to it. And I was talking to Martin Starr at some point. It was like right when I just started making music in some way. And it was, I mean, the music I made at the time, boy, I, I, I shudder to think <laughs> <laughs> like what it, what it actually <laughs> sounded like. Um, but uh he and I were just talking about making music and he was talking about how he, he and his friends had like kind of a, a, like a funny rap group or something. Uh, and we just, we just talked about it and then it was, it was over. And then the class like later that night, or maybe like a few days later went and saw the movie. And afterwards he, he and I were just standing outside. He was probably like 18 at the time. And I was like, you know, 13 or 14. and there was just kind of like this awkward moment. And he was like, you want to hear that, that music I was telling you about? I was like, sure. And then we just went in his, his rental car and he played me his CD. And then I played him my CD. And that's, (laughs) that's, that's that's basically it. That's, that's my little Martin star story. Oh, sick. Yeah. How was it? I have, I don't remember. It was probably bad. (laughs) I'm sure it was bad. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, I've noticed that uh, your press photos are uh, frequently taken by uh, best-selling author Dan Ozzy. That's right. Let's hear about this. How did you rope in uh, an author to take all your press photos? That's a great question. Um, I've just been friends with Dan for like since like 2014 or something, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just kind of became friends online. I forget, I forget how it really started. Uh, maybe he reached out to me and asked me to play some like noisy vice show that they were doing in New York, like with maybe with Cayetana and somebody else. I forget who else was on the show. Um, and it was, it was around a time where my, where fake problems was kind of breaking up and I was, I was not really sure what I was doing. And I was basically just saying yes to anything that came around. And I, had a little bit more uh, money than I normally had because I had made a shirt that went viral. So I, 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 I made like, you know, not a, an insane amount of money, but enough money to feel like to, more money than I had previously ever made. Um, Wait, so what's, what's the shirt? It says it's a picture of uh, Will Smith and his family. And it says the Smiths on top of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Very famous shirt, and and uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon right uh, gave uh, gave one of them to Will Smith on the Tonight Show right on the on the first episode of Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show. Oh, uh, was it the first yeah, episode? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, did did you see? I know I know that I'd read that it started blowing up before that on Reddit. Yeah, uh, but did the Jimmy Fallon bump? Did that was that significant, or was it already at that place? It was kind of already there, and. And I quickly learned um, a little bit before that and definitely during that, that when you have a shirt like that, that is kind of like 
you know, legally vague. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that basically everybody who makes shirts is just going to make the exact same design and put it in in their web store too, right. and you can't really do anything about it. So at a certain point, it just became like I was lucky if if I was the the website people found, you know. But before before it got that big, it was kind of like a nice steady thing, and then it kind of you know. I still I still make them. I still sell a few a month, probably, you know, it's whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that really gave me like that. That was just such a lucky thing that gave me a little bit more flexibility to kind of it, it, it really uh, made it really possible for me to start traveling to New York more often because Jeff and I had just started working on like the Antarctica Vespucci stuff. And so we would I would kind of just come up like every other month basically. And, and we would work on stuff and we had a podcast together and all this, but anyway, so I was kind of around New York a lot more. And Dan, I think if, if, if I'm remembering right, that this is kind of how Dan and I kind of uh, became friends mm-hmm. uh, in that, in that kind of general time frame. And then he like interviewed Jeff and I for like the, the first Antarctica record and yeah. And so, yeah. And we've been friends ever since he came to my wedding. He got a bunch of bug bites on his legs. Um, it was in Florida outside. Uh, <laughs> uh, and now he lives in LA and I hang out with him weekly. And you said, um, I need some press photos of me in a pool. Will you please do me the honor? Well, yeah. Well, Dan and I, well, so Dan has been taking pictures for a while and he's kind of like slowly been getting more and more into taking pictures. And anytime we would be hanging out, he would take pictures of me and they were always really good pictures. And I was always like, these are great. And um, when I told him about the idea for he was one of the first people I told about my idea for the my soundtrack record, which is like a fake uh, a soundtrack movie to a, a movie that a soundtrack record to a movie that doesn't exist. It's, a, yeah. it's like death. Don't yeah, wait. Death. Don't wait. It's mostly instrumental, except the theme song is sung by Laura Stevenson. It's kind of like the, you know, it's a very James Bond esque type thing. Uh, and so he and I had kind of like, like he was there from like the ground of the idea and it just, and he like totally got it and like, it's like totally understood what I was going for. And, it just made sense to kind of have him do pictures. And at the time he, he, or Andy still is the place he's staying. Um, he stays in the guest house of a very, very nice house. And at the time his, the people in the main house were not uh, in town. And so he was like house sitting the main house, which is like a very cool looking house. And so we kind of had the idea to, to do the photos there. These aren't your press photos, but um, I know that, Dan did a bunch of photos of various friends in front of Glenn Danzig's house. You were one of them. Yep, yep, yep. What's the story behind that? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm just a, another another person to to be photographed in it. But I think at, at a certain point he found out where Glenn Danzig's old house is, and just would take photos of of his friends. <laughs> just standing in front of it because like, it's it's like in an area where like there's other stuff around so you kind of kind of if you're like hanging out you know uh in los feliz you, you can just like bop on over there and, and get your picture taken and it just kind of became <laughs> his uh so a, th- a thing he does what did you think of the house i mean i could only see it from the outside it looked like a uh, like a house to me <laughs> <laughs> Nothing Glenn Danzig ish about it. No, not n- not nothing particularly uh, uh, spooky or or um, grouchy about it to me. In 2014, you wrote an article for Vice um, talking about how to be a good punk celebrity. Oh, great! Yeah, I bet that's a good article. <laughs> yeah, very lots of good advice. Um, a lot of people uh, asked, or not a lot of people, but a few people. Uh, <laughs> like messaged me and was like, Hey, could you clarify this for me? I'm trying to figure this out. And I'm like, <laughs> I never replied because I was like, I don't know how to get this through this person's head that this is not serious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Because I mean, some of your advice is like, uh, make sure you tweet big things coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like basically all the stuff that all of us make fun of when people do. Yeah, all the all the extremely annoying things bands uh, do every day online. Okay, so it's been a few years. Is there any advice you'd like to tack on to that in your uh, in your subsequent years as a punk celebrity? Um, tweet about uh, you, you, you. It's imperative to to tweet about how you don't make money, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody. Uh, oh God, this could go down a dark path. Uh, <laughs> Uh, constantly, yeah, constantly talk about how you don't make money and how the the music industry is dying. <laughs> um, uh, that that really uh, engenders a, a sense of, uh, of of excitement in your fan base. I'm sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah that that would be the main one. That's that's the main uh, my main new advice. I, I see a lot of people doing that. It seems to really work for them. Let's talk about your tweet Twitter a little bit. Um, what, do you do you have any uh, just tucked away in your mind? your greatest tweet of all time? Um, I, yeah. Um, I guess the one that I see kind of get like retweeted out of nowhere, you know, like people will kind of rediscover it. It doesn't even have like compared to like truly viral tweets. It doesn't have that many, but, um, I, I tweeted, uh, eight, eight something called a wheat brownie. And now I feel insane. It works better if you look at it, <laughs> but uh, that that one, I think that that one was a, a pretty. I feel good about that one. What did that do for your punk celebrity status? Probably nothing, if I had to guess. <laughs> 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 I mean, v- v- going viral, like Twitter t- tweets, going viral, like uh, everybody I know, I feel like has a viral tweet now, and they're like astronomical, like viral like 20,000 retweets and stuff. And I'm, I, I, the, that one I was talking about has like maybe 2000 retweets. Mm-hmm. Going viral actually seems probably more stressful than beneficial. Oh, definitely. I, I will say when the, when the Smith shirt thing happened, even though it was like, had nothing to really do with my name or, or anything, it, it was stressful. It, it felt weird. It, it was kind of like, giving it gave me a lot of anxiety and i was making money off of it too which was awesome but it was still like i don't know it that much attention when you have never had it is is bizarre particularly online int- attention because people can just take issues with the weirdest things totally of course yeah and and totally misinterpret your intentions and of course see you through the worst possible lens absolutely yeah yeah so yeah internet's a fun place on Instagram, uh, one of my posts, I think it was the post where, um, cause you and I met in LA. Yes. Uh, diner show. Yes. And I, I, I posted one, a photo where we were both in the back. You and I were photo bombing. That's right. We weren't in, in the foreground at all. Yeah. And, um, someone said like, oh, Chris Farron, he hates ska. Right. Uh, but then you said, no, I don't hate ska. I just don't have, uh, just don't have a lot of experience with ska. Right. But. No, 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 what I'm asking, the one I ask about is they said, oh, um, I hear that uh, uh, Jeff and John used to just tease him about uh, his lack of sky history on stage. Well, yeah, so we would. So obviously, Jeff and John, are, you know, have a very tight and like uh, symbiotic uh, musical relationship with each other. And so when we started doing Antarctica shows. I'd be tuning my guitar and all of a sudden they're playing some fucking ska song. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? I'm trying to be cool over here. Not playing this fucking water park music. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, and I would, you know, do that basically on stage and they would kind of make fun of me back like that. It was, that was kind of the, you know, fun, lighthearted, uh, uh, ribbing. Yes. Yes. I don't even know how to do that. Dicky, 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 dicky. You can't play the ska guitar? I don't think so. I mean, I could, you know, anything's possible. I could figure it <laughs> you've out. You've never, you've never taken, uh, you've never talked to one of your ska friends and said, can you teach me how to play ska? No. Damn. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, I can't see why I would ever need to. Um, but I will say I am, I am on the most critically acclaimed ska record of 2021 or 22. 
whatever 2021 2021 ska dream i have a guitar solo on it beautiful guitar solo so in that what song are you on uh fucking <laughs> <laughs> there's no song called fucking uh gosh oh god hold on i gotta look at the track listing uh leave it leave it in the ska i think leave it in the ska all right wait there, uh yeah leave it in the yeah leave it in the ska yeah so in in that in because of that i am whether the ska community likes it or not I am a part of Scott history. <laughs> True. You're in the Scott canon now. So, and now that can be considered Scott guitar playing. That's right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I do know how to, I practically invented <laughs> modern Scott guitar playing. Really modern. Yeah. Really, really recent modern. What is your origin story with Jeff? With Jeff. Okay. So our bands, uh, his band bomb, the music industry and my band fake problems. We, we just kind of like knew each other, or, like had a lot of mutual friends and that like, he like came to a show in New York and, and we got, we all got along and then bomb was going on tour and, and we decided to do like, we pr- pr- probably played like three shows together in Florida, th- three like fake problems, bomb the music industry shows. And we got along really well, but, that was basically it. Like we didn't like really keep in touch. We, he would still like come to shows um, when we would come through New York. And, and I think we had him solo in Naples, Florida once or twice as well. Um, but we weren't that close. We were just like, you know, like a little, a little more than acquaintances, but, but not like close friends or anything. Um, but then, I forget exactly how it happened that we started talking more and more, but around the time bomb was breaking up and fake problems was kind of fizzling out. He and I just were just talking a lot more and talking about doing something together. Cause I had, I had been up in New York trying to write songs with different people that uh, fake problems. Old manager had kind of set up like a bunch of co-writes. They call them in the biz. And it was a oh. pretty miserable experience. I had never done that before. And I had a really kind of bad time trying to write songs with people who I didn't feel any connection to or relate to in any way. Anybody notable that you tried doing that with? Uh, uh, no, yeah. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but uh, I was kind of up, up there in New York kind of talking about how it was kind of a weird experience. Uh, and Jeff was like, let's, let, how about you and I try to write a song together? And I was like, sure. Yeah, let's do it. And so we, we wrote something together and it was like the only, and it was the only thing that kind of came out of the trip. And it wasn't even something that was like set up, like officially, it was just kind of like in passing kind of came up and it was just kind of a cool song and we were really excited about it. And then we were just talking more and more about our bands breaking up. And then we decided, well, let's, why don't we make a whole record of, of something like this? And, uh, and then I came up, uh, to record the first Antarctica record. Actually, I came up the day after the, the tonight show thing happened, which was kind of crazy. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I, 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 Jeff has told this story and I, I have told this story before, but like, we were both like, I, I, I arrived at his apartment. He buzzed me in and I'm like walking up and, and, it, and it kind of dawned on me as I'm walking up the stairs that I'm like, I'm about to spend like a week here and I barely know Jeff. And he tells <laughs> basically the same story from his point of view. They're like, this guy's about to stay here for like a week and I don't know him. <laughs> and, uh, and then luckily it just went really, really well. Like, you know, in between like, you know, working on songs together, we would like go out to eat and stuff and, and kind of just talk about this kind of very unique situation that both of us were in where we're our, our kind of like the band that we had spent our life, you know, our, the, our life up to that point, really working really hard on and trying to make a thing. Uh, you know, kind of fizz- going away and just what the hell we were both going to do next. And 
yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of a, a for both of us. I mean, I, I can say because I've heard him say this before, but it just, it making that first Antarctica record made both of us kind of like believe in ourselves again, musically and kind of gave us like a, a level of hope and kind of like a feeling of possibility that like it wasn't over in some way. And not necessarily like, oh, this is so good. We're going to be so famous because of this record. It was just like, we just had such a good time with it. And it, I think it had been a long time since either of us had had a good time making music. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious about what your guys' process for writing together was. Because I know, I'm not sure so much what your process is, but I know Jeff often writes songs. He hears them complete already in his head. Right. So I'm curious what the collaboration was like. So mostly, basically, uh, it would be I would have like a acoustic demo or like a garage band demo. That would be that would usually be either a full song or like half a song. Uh, and Jeff would kind of listen to it and be like, either let's, you know, move this verse here change this part to happen here kind of rearrange stuff and just make the songs flow better and then in some cases there would be things that were like oh this isn't really like i think we can make a better chorus and then we would kind of just sit together and just kind of try to think of a better chorus and kind of uh you know just go back and forth it, it usually st or i can't i think it, it would always start with kind of like some version of a demo that i would bring and then we would we would kind of deconstruct them and and you know kind of throw stuff out the window and just go at it until it it seemed like it made sense yeah and i'm and i'm really like not, i'm i'm super when i collaborate with people i'm like super like not precious about anything of mine i i don't care if like i like something but if they if somebody if, like if somebody has a better idea i'm like great let's do that i don't yeah let's go in uh like like Facebook, I, I'm I'm in like a, the Jeff Rosenstock like Facebook group, sure. and a topic that comes up frequently is, you know, when are we going to get a, a when are we going to get a new Antarctica record? Right. This, this is something the fans want. They're clamoring, aren't they? The cl they are. I know. And, you know, probably, eventually, I, I guarantee, eventually, <laughs> I. I swear to God, may may God strike me down. It will certainly eventually happen. Um, I think it's it's very it's kind of funny because since Jeff moved to L.A., we have spent so much more time together. But we have because of that, I think it has made it like kind of because uh, Antarctica, like we would it would be like okay, I'm going to fly to you and we're going to do this in this amount of time. And now it's kind of like, well, we could always do it. So let's never do it basically. Um, uh, but I think we, we have, we have talked uh, a lot about doing it uh, something this year. So I don't think anything would come out this year, but uh, I would love it. I would be, I think we would both be, very happy with something coming out next year. All right. So we'll see. So this year. Yeah, sure. <laughs> this year, a this solid month. maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So in uh, 2018, you played the Chris Gethard show. Yes. Okay. So and then during your show, the the one on TV, the like on on a uh, uh, cable cable TV, True TV. Yeah. Yeah. He made the. Chris made the jump to True TV, and he said, "I gotta have Chris Farron, or I'm not not moving to True TV." That was a big part of the contract negotiations. I heard, yeah. And you said, "I'm only playing your show if you put Chris Farron masks on the entire audience." Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that was my demand. No, that was so cool because I was, uh, I think I was, I was on tour with Laura Stevenson. And like during during like the planning of of of, of playing when they when they had been kind of calling me and and you, when you play on TV there's like a lot of like you have to get stuff cleared and stuff there's a, a lot of like little logistical things you just have to do um, 
so I'd been kind of going back and forth with some of the production staff on the show. And then they, they started asking me, do you want to do anything like special? And my first thing was like, oh, I have like projections during my set. So that would be really cool. So that we set that up. That was awesome. Um, and they're like, yeah, if there's anything else you want to do, just let us know. We would love to like facilitate anything. And it was Laura Stevenson, like, uh, who was just like next to me in a rental car, who was like, oh, you should have them make masks of your face. <laughs> and I was, I, I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And, and so I kind of said it like kind of half joking, but they were like, oh, yeah, let's do that. And they were like so excited to do it. They went like so above and beyond like what I expected it to be. It was so cool. I was like everybody on that show was so that was like one of the most like welcoming environments I had ever been in, especially for such like a pro, you know, like real TV show environment. Like everybody was so nice, so accommodating and just like like so excited. You know, it was awesome. Well, they definitely went out of their way to make it seem like it wasn't a real professional show. Sure. I mean, that was like the 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 style. That's the vibe. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in reality behind the scenes it was a very professional thing sure sure but it, yeah but but not not in like a it certainly didn't feel like they were like okay we're gonna pretend like we're shitheads but we're actually <laughs> suits uh it was it was all just it was like a bunch of like you know true like diy kids and like you know the people from the public access show just had gotten an opportunity to like you know play in the big leagues or whatever you want to call it. And we're all taking it very seriously, but also still capturing like the, what was great about the public access show. Mm -hmm. You said that you didn't have much of history with Scott. What is your history of ska? Had you, had you ever gone to a ska show as a, when you were younger? Probably. Well, so like in Naples, Florida, there was no real venues, so it was all just DIY shows all the time at like community centers, and it was always it was always like a hardcore band, a pop pop punk band, an acoustic guy, and a like a ska band. You know, like it would always be just like a mishmash of just whatever, whoever could could play, um, or like whoever whatever touring band was coming through and whatever local bands they could get on it. So I certainly saw some ska bands in my time. I can't remember the names of any of them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, any local bands that you can recall? There was a local ska band called Murdoch's Revenge. Oh, sounds like a ska band, doesn't That's it? Definitely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think the only ska CD I ever owned was the Aquabats. Um, it's like a B side CD, maybe. Huh. Hold on, let me see what it's called. Uh, it's called. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Myths, Legends, and Other Amazing Adventures, Volume 2! <laughs> Do you have any idea why, of all the albums by the Aquabats, you chose that one? I don't know. I think it was, probably had something to do with Napster, if I had to guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> just randomly, like, downloading stuff. You know, it might be because on that record, there is a song called I Fell Asleep on My Arm, and I was at, at, not at the point when I bought the CD, but... I had a lot of uh, knowledge of new metal. I was super into new metal as as a kind of a preteen, um, like Corn and Slipknot and Limp Biscuit and Stained and all that garbage. Um, and there's a song that is kind of a parody of like a bunch of those types of bands all in one uh, that I always thought was very funny. And I think that is that is probably what hooked me in. And I like I looking at the track list of this right now. It's I I really enjoy a lot of these songs still. Pool party, pizza day, classics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Th this record. I mean, I I I I don't know much about uh, uh, other Aquabats records, but there's something very like almost we like kind of ween esque about this Aquabats record. And I'm a really big uh, fan of ween as well. Wait, so ba backing up just slightly, the, the music that you played for Martin star was that new metal? No, it was, it was, uh, it was more like uh, if I, I'd say it was probably more like kind of like trip hop. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> bizarre. It's an embarrassing. Very uh, cool. uh, yeah. <laughs> 
So the scene in Naples, uh, as uh, as you were coming up with fake problems, was uh, just a little bit of everything. It didn't really lean one way or the other. Uh, no, not really. Uh, there was definitely a lot of hardcore bands, um, but it became like a thing pretty quick that like the venues didn't want to have hardcore shows because the hardcore kids would always break everything. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, there was like, there was like a dance studio that was having shows for a while. And then the hardcore kids all like broke the mirrors. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> you know, so it was all, it was kind of all like a, like, you know, pop punk and like sc- screamo and like, yeah, like a lot of stuff like that, I guess. What was the, uh, the main, DIY space or spaces. Uh the the main one for me at least, the one that I have the most memories at is was a place called the Fleshman Community Center or Community Park. And it was basically like there was a skate park out back and the the room that we had shows in was basically just like a big carpeted room where there was most of the time was just like gym gymnastics like mats and stuff and we would just like push them all to the side and then set up a PA and, and just have shows in there and, and fake problems. Uh, we booked against me to play there. Like after against me, it was already kind of, you know, uh, post, uh, uh, the eternal cowboy and stuff. So it was, it was kind of like a very exciting big deal that, that they were like coming back to Naples. Was there any bands, uh, at the time that were like the big band of town, you know, in the DIY DIY scene at least. Um honestly, big problem. <laughs> <My old problems. laughs> we, yeah. kind of, we were kind of one one of them. Uh there was um who else was there? There was a pop punk band called Later Days that was that was pretty big. Uh gosh. There was kind of the older kids, uh, older like like a generation above me. Um, a band called Die Tomorrow and a band called Noah's Apathy. And those were kind of more like sunny day real estate, kind of like hot water music, kind of a little bit more mature uh, Mm -hmm. rock, pop rock or whatever you want to call it. I want to talk about the cup. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) This is a, (laughs) quite, it's an incredible piece of merchandise. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I don't know that I can even do justice with this merchandise is. Will you, Will you please tell people what the cup is? Okay, so as as I mentioned before, I made a a um a a soundtrack album to a movie that doesn't exist. Um and you know, when you make a record now, you have to think of like, oh, what's like going to be like the pre-order bundle? Like what what kind of merch am I going to sell with it? <laughs> um and I had a few ideas and I was I was kind of just like going online and thinking like you know, what, what are items that are commonly used to promote movies or have been in the past? And I just kept kind of thinking about like, like when I was a kid, like in the early two thousands and I would, I saw like the new Godzilla movie, there was like a cup that like you could buy, you know, like a commemorative cup at the movie theater. And I was like, Oh, a cup, that would be perfect. Um, and so I kind of, uh, I mean that's basically it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's basically the story. Uh, but then, um, it, so at some point, it became a sentient being, though. Well, I, I, I was really uh, kind of. Uh, I got a little bit of pushback on the cup. Uh, at, like I was told, it was it was going to be hard to make, or 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 it would maybe not sell very well, and that kind of like lit a fire in me that was like, oh, you'll see, you'll see. <laughs> And so I kind of, you know, went uh, insane. And I and I'm certain I I have uh, posted and promoted the cup way more than the record that it is supposed <laughs> to be promoting. Um, so I kind of just just got obsessed with the cup and would just post about it all the time. And it just it became a thing where I was like, this is so stupid and so ridiculous to be talking about this piece of plastic this much. But the good part is that um, the cup has its own merchandise, right? You, there's a shirt. You can get that says I bought the cup. That, yeah. yeah, that says I bought the cup. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, great shirt. I love that shirt. <laughs> and, and so um, the cup went to Coachella, right? Yeah. So Spin Mag, a friend of mine, interviewed me for Spin about the cup, uh, or interviewed the cup about the cup, um, and 
then the people at Spin thought the interview was so you know fun and ridiculous or whatever. They were like, "Hey, we're going to Coachella. Uh, can you give us some cups or a cup, and we'll <laughs> we'll take it, and we'll just you know take pictures and kind of you can kind of uh, we'll we'll text you what the picture is, and you can write a caption for it. We'll post it, and that was kind of the the genesis of that. It was very funny. Yeah, I think my favorites are um, there's one where the cup is pitting in the turnstile while turnstile's playing. Yep, 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 yep. There's one, uh, the cup is uh, hanging out with the band The Who. That's uh, H-U. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's a, a, cu- there's a, there's a picture of the cup on the Ferris wheel. Right. And then also uh, the cup got to meet Manic and Pussy. Yes, 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 yes. And, and the cup got to meet some, uh, gosh, I don't know her name offhand, but some like K-pop star that I, I, when I reposted it, like a bunch of people were like, how the fuck did this happen? And I'm like, I don't know. Hey. Spin never said like, oh, well, why don't you go and put the cup places? I know. What the hell? <laughs> they should. Yeah, that would have been fun. But no, I had to. I had to yeah, I just sit home covered in blood and feathers from the freaking turkey <laughs> sitting here tweeting about the cup. Now, last year when you were on tour and uh, I think you were in tour in Europe with uh... Is either Gaslight Anthem or Brian Fallon? I can't remember. Both. I did both within within like the like two months of each other. Like I did one like one month long tour with him, and then another like five week or something tour with them right after. Now, wasn't there a point where you had no merch with you? There certainly was. <laughs> what, what, what happened there? I'll never forget it. I was making absolutely no money. How could I forget? Um, it was it was kind of a a a perfect storm of just shit happening. Um, I think because of Brexit there, it's a lot more difficult to have merch shipped from the UK to Europe, which my merch company at the, at the time was a UK based uh, company. And so they sent something to meet me at the first show and it did not arrive. And then basically for the next like two weeks of that tour, like, the merch would arrive at a venue the day after I left. Like it, it, oh, it happened man. an out of control amount of times. Like so much that like I stopped talking about it to the people on the tour because I was like, I was like humiliated. I was like, this is only reflecting poorly on me at this point that I'm like, I'm fucking this up so bad. But I will say the merch company was doing a very bad job as well. And then like, uh, like a few months later, there was like a big gigantic like thing that happened with the merch com- it was that company awesome merch who fucked over top shelf records and a bunch of other people uh and at the at, at, before that happened i was like am i going crazy are these people like really not doing a good job here uh and then i realized no they they were doing a very bad job and i was right to think that <laughs> how many uh, how many shows would you say that you uh played with no merch oh uh probably like nine or ten uh (laughs) luckily thank god that i was on tour with brian fallon who is a a very good friend of mine a very very generous man i was riding on the bus with them so i didn't really have any expenses you know I, i wasn't i didn't have to stay at hotels or anything and in europe especially catering is really good so i didn't really have to spend money on food or anything um and then uh Brian had the idea that we would he and I, I we would we started a joint cameo together just for the tour uh where and all the money would just go to to my uh to me <laughs> how many people uh got themselves a, a Chris and Brian cameo uh, we 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 did probably 200 we wow. we we did them like 30 at a time and then like <laughs> and then cl- closed it and then would open it again and close it uh yeah, it was fun. It was a very easy way to make money. <laughs> uh, yeah. Especially when it's it's like just mostly Brian Fallon fans and I'm just like just, hey, hey, and me hey. too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it it is such a bizarre experience um you know, cuz especially in Europe for me at least like I'll play a show and kind of be like, "Oh, the crowd didn't really like me." 
But then like the end of the night, I was like, oh, I sold a, a good amount of merch. I guess it's just, you know, I, I just it's just they have a different way of expressing it. But those shows, those first like 10 shows or whatever, like there would be shows where I was like, wow, everybody either, you know, it felt like everybody loved me or it felt like everybody hated me. And I, that would be all I would have to go on because I would just like have no other metric based just except for just based on their faces in the crowd. So, okay. I want to go, I want to go back real quick. I want to touch back on the uh, Turkey problem story. Uh, um, this is questions for Adam though. Okay. I forgot to ask this. I was going to ask this earlier. Um, link 80. Uh-huh. Did anyone in link 80 ever pleasure themselves in the van while it was moving? Definitely. We had, we had, um, <laughs> We had like a bunk bed in the back. Definitely. Like we we had like a oh, yeah, there you go. Like an area under the loft <laughs> called the hole. Yes. And people definitely jerked off down there. <laughs> yeah. It's a long tour. Two months is a long time. <laughs> a whole weekend? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. That's all I needed to know. Moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> I uh so you you made a billboard for Born Hot. Yes, and on, on the billboard, you put, it went up on Sunset Strip. It said, "Call the uh, Born Hotline." That's right. Uh, I called it. Uh, it's not. It's disconnected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was three years. That was a while ago. Yeah. When did you disconnect I, it? Um, probably, probably like a year ago. Definitely had it going for way longer than necessary. <laughs> um. <laughs> Because Polyvinyl was still paying for for the number to be active, <laughs> and oh, okay. and which which basically means I was still paying for the number to be active in some roundabout way. Uh, yes. Yeah. So they were like, "Hey, do you want to keep this going?" Or and I was like, "Ah, we could probably shut it down now." <laughs> so what was on the uh, what was on the message? People. So so if you look at the billboard, it just says "call the number." It doesn't really say much else. Right. So so the so the I think initially. There was a message that said, just like, you know, press one to hear the new Chris Barron single. It would play like a song and it would sound so shitty because it was like <laughs> through the phone. And I think I even made it. I, I think I even made a shittier version to put in there, <laughs> like, like an even more like phone sounding yeah. one. Um, so that was the initial thing. And then I had my friend Shelby come over and she's just like a, a, a very funny person and has a like a, a very a uh, good voice for something like this and and just kind of made her say just all sorts of stuff and like made all sorts of kind of you know winding you know you could press this to go here and uh there was one where it's like uh here tour dates and it was just her just listing all the tour <laughs> all of my tour dates just in a row which is just uh it was kind of like like movie phone but for Chris Farron fans it was like the the least convenient way to get information, basically. <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, you don't want to. You don't want to uh, inconvenience itself by going online. Right. Call exactly. up the hotline. Exactly. That's also Jeff and I for for the Antarctica record we put out on Polyvinyl. One of our merch items was uh, pens, and on the pen it had the u the url for our spotify page but it was like you know it's like one of those urls that's just like spotify.com slash you know antarctico vespucci slash a slash u a v l j r r r r it's just like a long yeah <laughs> w w w <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> born hot so this is the record you were promoting um yeah 2019 i believe yeah yeah okay this song this album i feel like is a particular uh juxtaposition i mean i I know this has kind of always been your songwriting style but this one in particular i feel like really just juxtaposes the songs about depression and anxiety and self-doubt um with upbeat pop sounding and sort of your overall yeah presentation of it hey and isn't that a ska thing Yes. Thank you. I'm Ska. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you know something about Ska. You know, yeah. you know, not, not all Ska songs are pizza party. Right. Some of them are pool party. <laughs> Some of them are pool party. <laughs> and that's it. Those two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, and hey, I played with Ska legends. Hold on. Let me Google what they were called. 
at, at Wembley Arena with the Gaslight Anthem, I played with, oh, hold the on, selector. the Selector, of course, <laughs> yes. They, they were great. They were amazing, actually. I was That was a very cool experience to watch them play, even though I had just heard of them a week before. It was still very, <laughs> very cool. It was still legitimately a very, very good, good set. So I want to ask about, so I know I've read you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, the, the, the stuff you talk about in your songs are real and the, the, the Chris Farron persona of being like cocky and overconfident and all the bizarre like ways of marketing, a little bit of a way to sort of deal with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Does doing it this way actually function as a, is being cathartic, you know, working through the things you're singing about for you. I think, I think so. And I think even, even the, whatever the, the quasi persona e way I present myself is not so much a persona, but more of like a, like extremely humiliating, vulnerable, like way of just like showing what I actually feel like, but, um, but know that it's ridiculous to feel like that. Like, Mm. you know, as a songwriter, I'm like out there going like, look at me. These are my precious little poems that I wrote and everybody should pay attention to me, you know? And I think a lot of people like, I feel like, I feel like most songwriters feel like that in general, but you have to pretend to be so like cool and like indifferent to everything and I think it is just funny to kind of be, uh, you know, kind of baldly like, look at this thing I'm doing, you know, like, give me attention. Like, just saying, give me attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already standing on a stage. Obviously, I want attention, you know? So I'm just kind yeah. of like filling in, filling in the blanks. And that's funny. I mean, I, I do it because I think I think that's funny to be so... Uh, ridiculous and and in a way honest about it. And obviously, I'm exaggerating and and kind of going a little bit farther. But uh, I I just I feel like I spent so much time myself being kind of uh, pretending uh, or trying to be cool or something or 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 uh, what I thought people would think is cool and at a certain point i was just like Ugh, i feel I, it feels disingenuous to me yeah I, I get that like art is like art is should and, and is like a vulnerable thing but like our our culture's treatment of art is different than that mm-hmm. right yeah yeah I, it's interesting though because i think like um like if if you are in fact a person that deals with like self-doubt and stuff yeah Watching you tweet like absurdly confident things, mm-hmm. even if it's like you kind of know that there's a joke to it, it still kind of works where you're like, oh, maybe, you know, this guy's confident. Like it's still. <laughs> I, I think it, it's, it's, it's like aspirational. I'm like, it's like kind of like, man, this is what I really wish I, I felt like or wish I could really like commit to feeling like this all the time. because. You know, like while I, you know, want attention and want like my art to be beloved and the most respected art of all time, uh, I also, um, you know, sit while I'm writing songs and go, this is the fucking dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. Why am I even doing this? You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's, yeah. So there's a bit of that too, where it's just like, you know, I, I know myself. Uh, and I'm mostly just trying to make myself laugh and just thinking like, like saying I'm so confident, uh, is just so funny to me because I'm so like, so, uh, I don't know. I'm saying two different things I feel like, but somehow they make sense to me. Yeah. And I think like, um, it's kind of the, t- back to the TikTok conversation, like the way you make art and the way you promote art and the way you put things out there is, is, isn't for like it's it's not you're not thinking about the widest possible audience possible 
Oh, yeah. I mean, you're thinking of the most (laughs) specific audience. Yeah. I mean, I've often said that my stuff is kind of like, especially like some of the tour videos I've made this year. Like it's like it's it's like viral proof. Like it's like couldn't go viral. (laughs) It like can't go viral because it's so like insular and like there's such like a weird backstory to it that you have to have seen the other ones. It's just like so bizarre. But I just have such a good time making them that i kind of don't care uh yeah um i want to ask you a little bit about the song uh, are you still there yeah this one like definitely strikes me as the most vulnerable on the record mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about um where the song comes from yeah uh b- 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 that song is about so my wife's father passed away uh in 2017 or 18 um and that song is just basically about you know watching your partner deal with grief and trying to be there for them and how that can be scary and sad and very hard uh yeah that's what that song's about (laughs) the opening line uh you talk about let's see i've been been breathing weird for the entire year the year Heath Ledger died, at least Prince is still alive. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, that was that was that line is a little abstract, but I, I definitely wanted to say something that kind of put the song in like a put put the listener in a different place than the than the narrator. Like because when you say, when I say that, I know that the listener will hear that and go, well, Prince is dead too. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) This guy just like, maybe this song was like written in between those times. And like, uh, he doesn't know yet that Prince is going to die. And I just thought that there was something interesting to me about, um, uh, hearing somebody say that somebody that everybody knows is dead, uh, is alive. And, that person is telling the truth as far as they know at that time. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Ni- nice way to open up the song. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So you talked about uh, you and Jeff having this sort of moment of refresh, I guess you could say. Yeah. And you guys did both start. He started doing Jeff Rosenstock. You started doing Chris Farron. His project went, became more and more of a, like a solid band. Mm hmm. But you went into this kind of interesting solo direction where it's like you're doing shows where you're playing alone, but you're playing with backing tracks, you're playing with projectors and yeah. lights. Talk about kind of what your show has uh, evolved into at this point. So, so when I when I first started doing solo stuff, I, I started just. So I, I guess we we were doing Antarctica stuff before I ever did any any solo stuff. And so I kind of through Antarctica was like, okay, I, I want to keep doing this. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I, I probably should just start doing something, even if it's not exactly what I want to be doing. So I started, I said yes to some like solo acoustic tour, even though I was like, I do, I want to be an acoustic, another, you know, acoustic former song, former band guy. Um, and so I did that for maybe like a year just playing acoustic. I did a, a few tours and I I gained a lot of confidence on stage by doing that and, and kind of learned a lot about talking to the audience more than I ever had because there was nothing, no sonic wall to hide behind. And I I liked that, but I I was bored and I felt like I was not the music I made did not really suit the acoustic thing that much um and so i started trying to figure out how to play to backing tracks and so i started doing that uh and i did that probably without any visuals for for a a little bit as well and then i saw like a video of me playing uh without sound and i was like well just looks like i'm fucking playing acoustic (laughs) still (laughs) like in a video and and i was like this this like if I saw this video without sound or with sound, I would be like, why would I go to this show? And so 
I <laughs> it just became important to me to try to to try to fill up the stage as much as a band did, not just sonically, but also visually. So then I started bringing projectors on tour and trying to figure out like at first I just made like a half an hour long ridiculous thing on iMovie that was just like a bunch of just ridiculous like cat videos and just whatever. Uh, and then I started figuring kind of figuring out like video synthesizer stuff and kind of stuff that would react more to the the tracks itself. So there would be kind of more of like a s synchronization element to that. Um, and then I would, br I started bringing like, like a big, you know, a, a white screen for the projector and everything. Um, that's kind of where it's at now. I bring two projectors with me. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm kind of in a transition, another transitional stage now because I'm going to start playing with a drummer. Mm. Uh, my, my friend Frankie is going to start playing drums with me live once my next record comes out later this year. Um, which I, I honestly still don't know what it's going to be and how it's going to work because I have to kind of figure out a whole new way of, of doing my, my show in many different ways, technically. Uh, but I'm excited to figure it out. And I, I figured it out before I'm, and other people do it. So <laughs> I, I should be able to figure it out too. <laughs> Does the new record, uh, is the new record finished or do you have a title for it? I, I do. Um, I will not reveal yet the title, but people who own the Death Don't Wait record can open the uh, liner notes and it says Chris Farron returns in dot, dot, dot. And then it says the name of my next record. Oh, okay. So you just must simply buy my, my record. <laughs> <laughs> you already own the cup. Yeah. Now go get the actual. Yeah, album. get the record. Yeah. Wait, are we going to get another cup with the next record? You know, I, I've been thinking about that. I probably not. Like, I think that would be a little. <laughs> what if it was glass, like the Burger King cups? Sure. Sure. That would be nice. <laughs> harder to travel with. Harder to bring sure. on tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. That, that has been kind of since, since I finished the album and the artwork and everything for the album. The thing that has been keeping me up at night has been, what is my next big merch item going to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So who knows? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still kind of at the point where I have no idea. But, you know, you, you never have an idea until you have an idea. Hmm. Is that interesting? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I heard that there is a, uh, there's an entire Fake Problems album that was never released. Yeah, that's right. So what can you tell us about this uh, never released album? Uh, so our, so fake problems, we were bopping around along, you know, we were never a very successful band. Uh, we probably opened for people too much and that kind of eventually made it, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what really happened with fake problems overall. They, uh, but, uh, we, our, our guitar player quit the band after, after we had done a bunch of touring for our, our last official album that was released, Real Ghost Caught on Tape. And that was, I really liked that record. That was kind of the first record that we made that I was like, oh, this is what we sound like. Like it was the first time I had felt like we had figured something out about our band and we were all playing really well together. And just, you know, for, for his own personal reasons, our guitar player quit the band and we decided to kind of soldier on, but it was kind of a band that had been like the four friends since we were teenagers. And as soon as he left, it just dynamic stuff, you know, it just changes, you know? Um, I think anybody in a band knows how that goes. Um, so the dynamic kind of just changed and it was, not as fun, but we were still just trying to like soldier on. And we, we met, we, we made another record with uh, Ted Hutt who made our, our previous record to that. And we just had a really bad time <laughs> in the studio working on the record. Uh, it just felt like 
we were all kind of pushing each other in different directions. And it wasn't like a contentious time necessarily, but it was just kind of like a, we were always kind of looking at each other going like, is this good or bad or anything? Like it felt like none of us knew what, what anything was. Um, and so when we finished the record, we just, none of us felt connected to it. And it felt kind of, we kind of felt just exhausted from making it. And around the same time, our manager stopped being a manager. And uh, in some ways, we had grown to kind of rely on him, which is very dangerous for a band. And that's why I tell bands not to have managers for as long as possible, if ever. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, so we just decided not to put the record out and 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 then the idea came like, oh, maybe we'll put out like seven inches of like two songs at a time. And we put one out. Uh, and that was around the same time I started doing Antarctica stuff. And I was kind of like, not really engaged in the band anymore. And uh, nobody else really was taking the reins either. And it kind of just fizzled away. So that's, so that record is uh, just, uh, bunch of wave files in a dropbox somewhere <laughs> no 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 consideration of just doing a like you know quote unquote just, yeah just like oh here, here here release it like or even like oh 10 years ago or whatever yeah maybe yeah that, that could be a thing yeah all right possible i mean i you know looking back on the songs and and i think they are probably a lot better than i than any of us gave it, them credit for in my Wife has told me they're very good. And I, I trust her. I trust her. <laughs> uh, <aww. laughs> uh, but yeah, it, I think it was more less about the songs and more about just just like watching your childhood dream die <laughs> before your eyes sure. type thing that kind of uh, taints taints the them. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of far away from it enough now where it doesn't like I'm not like stressed out about thinking about fake problems anymore or anything like i think it's it's definitely something that i'm sure will eventually happen it's just i just have to figure out how to log back into the fake problems gmail <laughs> <laughs> i believe in you you can do it <laughs> thank you is there a release date for your new record um i believe it will be in a month that begins with a that i was not born in all right there you have it. I was born in April. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at in Defense of Ska. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Ska Punk International. This is your co host, Adam Davis of Omnigon, leaving you by saying Ska now more than ever. John uh, Denominici uh, told me to ask that. He called it the, quote, turkey problems story. <laughs> turkey problems. Love I think it. he kind of undersold it with the title. Yeah, for sure. That's a that's a wild ass story. I didn't I didn't think that we were going to be getting into that. But here we are. So I met Chris Farron in L.A. Yeah, um, how'd that go? In December. Well, it went great. And actually, that's what we talked about in the uh extended interview oh yeah so. it was a fun, it was it was well you'll hear if if you have a measly five dollars and you sign up for the patreon you'll hear because i didn't exactly know who he was at first and i learned through the conversation and i played it off cool and i i, I admitted it to him on the bonus stuff oh my goodness you want to yeah hear it was it was you want to hear Aaron at his most humble <laughs> You better tune into the Patreon. Hey, listen. Yeah. Really though, 
Patreon is just a way of voting with your dollar. It's just a way of saying, hey, I care about this thing. I'd like to see this thing keep happening. Beyond telling a friend about it, beyond listening to the show, it's just one extra step. You just sign up for it. You get the bonus content. And then you go on your merry way. Okay. Easy you peasy. Get the content early. Yeah. Listen, you've got probably got memberships to things that you haven't bothered canceling yet. They cancel are that four shit times then, more yeah. expensive than our Patreon. <laughs> and you're probably blowing money left and right. Oh, I meant to cancel that. I should have canceled it last month. Hey, this is your reminder to go cancel all that other stuff that you don't use and subscribe to the Indefensive of Scott Patreon for a fraction of the price. I just saved you money, basically, is what I'm saying. Yes. What right. do we have on next week? We have a delightful band called the Hooters. The Hooters. You're going to want to listen. Yes. Not the restaurant. <laughs> the rock and roll band that started as a ska band. <laughs>